Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, I'm Brian Mann. I appreciate that uh, that introduction, Jordan. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the evolution of Cypress, right? The the features that we have on our upcoming roadmap, uh, as well as the broader uh, vision. <clears throat> so to help me set some context as to where we're headed, let's take a look at what we offer today, which is primarily focused on test management. Now, if you're a developer or a QA engineer, uh, you're no doubt familiar with running npm install Cypress uh, to acquire our open source app. Uh, the app is uh, where you're going to spend most of your time writing and running your tests. And, uh, you know, I've been working on this project now for almost 10 years, a little over uh, nine years. And, uh, you know, we've just spent a tremendous amount of resources, you know, trying to build a better test runner, really focus on the developer experience, as, uh, as Jordan uh, mentioned earlier, uh, helping people be successful, uh, ease of use, giving you visual feedback with the, uh, the code that you write, and uh, packing in a ton of tools that make it easy to, to uh, debug. Now, the whole point of writing automated tests is that once they become easy to write, you'll quickly build up a, uh, a large suite of them. And so after integrating Cypress uh, into your uh, CI pipeline, this is you know, an opportunity for you to connect it to our cloud and go ahead and start recording your tests. Now, our cloud helps you and your team manage the tests by uh, focusing on things like smart orchestration, where we parallelize and load balance your specs, uh, dramatically reducing durations and run times. And we also offer up a suite of tools to help you detect and debug failures and flaky tests and uh, offer a set of integrations into uh, common uh, VCS providers like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket as well as uh, provide out-of-the-box analytics and reports uh, in order to help your team manage your tests. And uh, we've had several not notable releases over the last couple months. Uh, be sure to check out V13 if you're not already on the latest version. Uh, we made several changes to the default behavior of the app, uh, such as turning off video capture by default, as well as se several other performance improvements. There are a ton of bug fixes, most notably in some of the proxy layer, uh, for SIDOT Intercept. And really, the intention behind that and what that set the stage to do uh, was for us to deliver test replay. <clears throat> uh, the, the changes to V13, they were not only for performance, uh, but with test replay being released, a lot of the things such as capturing video by default or even uh, displaying the command log when your tests are running, uh, really became obviated. There was no more need to do that uh, now with, uh, with Test Replay. And uh, Test Replay is a feature that we've included in all of the uh, cloud plans. It's free. You don't have to have a paid plan. You don't have to purchase it as an add-on. And the goal of this was to provide first-class tooling to help you pinpoint the root cause of problems in CI. <clears throat> if you've uh, had any experience with writing uh, complex end-to-end -end tests, uh, you may have uh, come across uh, a challenge where you have a test that's passing locally, but when you go and run it in CI, uh, it fails. And that's often because you know, CI is running on completely different hardware, has different resources than your local machine. It's often configured differently. Maybe you're running on a staging environment. Maybe you have environment variables that change the behavior of it. And when we have failing tests in CI uh, that are behaving differently uh, and, and we can't reproduce them locally, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of time and effort in order to debug and pinpoint exactly um, where the problem is. And if you kind of think about it, you know, Cypress, the experience itself, when you're running locally, you, ha you have all this great tooling at your disposal. You can use the UI, inspect the elements, you have dev tools, you have all this functionality built in. Uh, but when you went previously into the cloud, you know, we gave you screenshots and we gave you videos, but those are sort of, you know, flat artifacts. You couldn't actually interact with them uh, or get that local uh, uh, debugging experience. So <clears throat> Test Replay uh, is our solution that basically brings the uh, debugging experience of the, uh, of the local app all the way into the cloud. So you know, you'll see a lot of common features in this video. Uh, it, it kind of looks like the uh, the local experience, right? We have 
uh, the ability to play uh, time scrubber. That's that's a little bit different than the app because effectively uh, with the app you're running the test, but in the cloud this is really just a playback of what was captured. But you know you have all your familiar power features like time travel, uh, the ability to inspect the DOM. So you can basically just right click on your application and see the DOM, see the CSS, write in your dev tools as if it was local. Um, we're also capturing all of the network requests, including you know the headers, the status code, the response bodies, uh, even the console logs that the browser emits. And uh, we have, have a pretty nifty experience around test retries that I actually think is also superior to the, uh, to the local experience. So really now, you know, you, we went from having videos and screenshots to now being able to interact directly with, uh, with the results, inspect, debug it, uh, step through it, uh, just like what we have uh, with, with, the, old, with the, uh, the local app. So with V13, you know, we turned off uh, video capture and we also stopped rendering the command log in run mode. Both of these things were performance drains. And as I mentioned, they've effectively been obviated by test replay. Uh, if you're not using the cloud, I mean, I encourage you to check it out, but you, of course you can pass flags to turn these back on. You can set, you know, video recording in your, in your config. It's just no longer on by default. So besides uh, test replay, which was you know one of our uh, more significant releases of the year uh, in the last couple months, uh, I want to take a look at a few other uh, things that we've got uh, coming up uh, that we're currently working on <clears throat> related to test management. So the uh, the three features I want to talk about is burn in uh, some updates to test retries as well as a uh, puppeteer plugin. Now burn in is a feature that we've been working on for a while. And you can think of it as going hand in hand with, with test retries. If you think about the way that test retries works today is that when a test passes, it just moves on. But if the test fails, then, and you have retries enabled, it's automatically going to rerun. Now, if you have a test that retries multiple times and each time it fails, that's actually not a flaky test because you're getting a consistent result. But if you have a test that can both pass and fail and yet you haven't changed anything about the environment, you haven't pushed new code or changed an environment variable, then really that means that it's able to reach two different outcomes. And that's what we consider to be flaky. And this works really well uh, if you have test retries enabled. Uh, but the problem is, is that if you think about what is the definition of a flaky test, well, it is a test that can both pass and fail. If it just fails every single time, it's not actually flaky at all, in fact, running it multiple times and getting you know three failures in a row actually doesn't indicate uh, there's flake. It actually tells you the opposite. There's not flake and that likely unless you go in and make a code change, you can run it you know an infinite amount of times and it's going to fail every single time. So the idea behind this is that burn-in complements uh, test retries because if you take a flaky test that can both pass and fail, well, what happens if just the very first attempt that it runs it happens to pass. Well, because it passes, we don't run it again. And that is often how a uh, source of flake is introduced uh, in your test code. Uh, you may be writing a new test uh, and it just happens to pass on that uh, on the first attempt. The code goes to merge and then effectively a flaky test gets merged in and it's sort of like a grenade going off in your code base that other people effectively have to deal with downstream. So burn-in is you know, what I consider to be a really elegant solution to this problem in that you know, <clears throat> if we always wanted to optimize for figuring out if tests were flaky, we could always just run all the tests multiple times, like every single commit. But that's really unnecessary and that would take a huge amount of resources and the vast majority of them would not be flaky. So burn-in is our solution wherein we effectively look at the history of the test how it's been performing. And we also look at other signals like if the test was just created and it has no history or if it was just modified, which effectively resets the history, then rather than wait for it to exhibit a uh, failure, we will effectively burn it in, which makes it run multiple times. So that means if it passes, you almost think of this as burn in is like the equivalent of test retries, except it's for passes. And that way tests are conditionally and effectively burned in 
Uh, but once they are burned in, then they'll only run once. So you get this sort of dynamic runtime behavior that optimizes both for the confidence in the test as well as not, uh, not inflating your overall runtime. And of course, this is a, uh, this is something that is derived just in time. So the, if the test changes or if it suddenly does exhibit flaky behavior, effectively it will get burned in again. It's not like uh, it only happens once and once. It's continually being reevaluated as, as the tests run. So <clears throat> that's a, a really exciting update. Uh, just to kind of show you a little bit of what this looks like. I mean, it's mostly a back-end feature and there's a lot of different aspects of the UI that is updating. But we're, now we're basically showing, you know, burn-in and test retries hand-in-hand -hand, uh, to effectively communicate to you, you know, what applied when a run happened, uh, what didn't apply, uh, whether it was co configured on or off so that you could effectively understand your, uh, your, the behavior of the tests. Now, um, as such, uh, we've had test retries for a while now. That's what I was just talking about. But in making burn-in work, uh, we realized that we really need to improve um, several different aspects of the way that test retries uh, behave. Right now, I would say it's fairly naive in the sense that you don't have any sort of tolerances or controls, meaning like a test, uh, you could set a test or retry, you know, 100 times and it failed 99 times in a row and on the 100th time it passes. And we would still consider the test at that point uh, passed. That means like CI is not going to exit uh, with uh, with an exit code of one. Things are going to code is going to be able to merge. And really, we're changing or upgrading the way that test retries behaves and giving you a lot more optionality and controls for determining you know your risk tolerance level. You can think of it as like a test running multiple times is there to figure out its flakiness, but how we ultimately interpret whether that test passed or failed is really based on your risk tolerances as an organization. It's possible that, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you had a test um, <clears throat> run uh, 99 times and fail and then run w once and, and pass, that that's good enough for you and you don't have a really high risk tolerance. But, you know, many of our organizations uh, have completely different ones. And sometimes it's even different on different branches. You may want to, you know, in your main branch or going out to production, have very low risk tolerances, whereas in future branches, you have something higher. So we're giving you the ability to basically set these thresholds and effectively control the strategy of what happens when you get into a situation where a test both passes and fail. It doesn't really matter how many times it, it runs or it doesn't really even matter what the final outcome of a test, that's, that's really just between you and CI and your processes. We just need the test to run multiple times and do run it multiple times for figuring out, you know, it's uh, how flaky it is. <clears throat> so we're also working on a uh, Puppeteer plugin. And really what this is, is uh, this is effectively a plugin that allows you to run, you know, browser automation commands outside of Cypress. Uh, there, you know, I, if you're a longtime user of Cypress, you probably know that our automation architecture, at least a lot of it, behaves very differently than some of the other uh, incumbents or competitors in the space. There's a number of different advantages to that. There's also certain disadvantages. Uh, there are things that you know you we have never really supported um, as a as a tool, whether it was uh, navigating or switching between tabs or uh, switching between windows or automating two browsers at the same time. And so really this is just a plugin uh, in which you know we're not handing off all the responsibility to you. We're still uh, under the hood wiring everything up and managing a lot of the state. but this is really a, simple uh, and elegant solution to sort of escape out of uh, Cypress to, to use Cypress to collaborate with, you know, a third party driver so that, you know, you can test extension behavior. You can effectively, you know, test a few scenarios and then come back into Cypress and we'll automatically do things like, you know, manage the window focus. We'll make sure that tabs and windows are cleaned up. We'll manage the connection to the browser so that the actual implementation is very like 
rudimentary and simple and we do all of the life cycle stuff all around it so that's another uh another uh plugin that we're working on <clears throat> so with that said i mean what uh we have been focused i would say uh for years now all around the the test management space um but you know i've thought for a while now that there actually is a bigger and more valuable destination uh, that we're headed towards that we're evolving uh to be able to do and uh, i wanted to uh, spend a few minutes talking about that and representing that uh by showing sort of how our vision uh itself has evolved uh to uh to expand what i think you know we're classically or uh, typically looked at um, uh, being able to handle. And so, you know, this year marks the, the first year for us in which we put, you know, a lot of resources around different initiatives uh, that started to explore this. In fact, Test Replay is one of the initiatives that came out of that. And, um, you know, throughout the beginning of, of the year, we've been, you know, uh, uh, primarily or really since the beginning of time, we've been primarily focused on test management, right? Which is writing tests, uh, it is managing tests, right? Uh, ultimately, these are what I believe to be just stepping stones on our way to something much bigger. And what we'd like to be able to do is still, you know, be near and dear to everything that is test management, but really leverage and utilize the tests uh, as a way of driving insights uh, broader insights in order to improve your application's quality. And so, you know, our evolved vision, uh, which is the end goal that we have in mind, is really to provide product teams with clear visibility into the health and quality of their applications uh, in order to continuously deliver innovation faster. And our mission, which is uh, what we're doing to achieve it, uh, well, it's really always been to delight developers with a superior open source test authoring experience enhanced by clear objective and quantifiable quality metrics that help developers and team members understand the impact of every code change. Now, uh, the most recent release of Test Replay has really put us in a phenomenal position to capitalize on uh, this unique opportunity, uh, and it is giving us the capabilities to evolve beyond just test management. And to kind of paint this picture to help you understand what we mean, uh, let's look at some of the benefits uh, that you know you as a user, your company would have uh, by um, expanding the value of the test and being able to measure app quality. Uh, writing uh, automated tests, and let me kind of just start with this. Writing automated tests is and will always be an essential part of the software development lifecycle. You know, end-to-end -end and component tests specifically are a form of functional testing. Therefore, they give you confidence that your application is at least functioning and working uh, as intended. Uh, but functional testing is one of many important dimensions of your application's quality. You know, even if something is functioning uh, properly or as intended as coded, there's still no guarantee that it looks correct or that it's, uh, or that you've tested everything in the UI thoroughly or that it's accessible, it's fast or uh, secure. And, uh, you know, our goals with, you know, helping you improve app quality and objectively measuring it is really to take uh, those same functional tests, uh, but use them in order to answer uh, many more important questions about these additional dimensions. And uh, I think as we all know, uh, writing functional tests is also a non-trivial investment. Uh, developer time is expensive, uh, but by reusing those same functional tests, we can naturally extend the value of them uh, of writing them uh, by using them to, you know, try to answer these questions, uh, but done so in a way uh, in which you don't have to change anything about the way you've written them or even write a new line of code. In other words, we want to be able to do this completely and totally automatically. Uh, if this is something that we can do and we're uh, working very hard in order to deliver that, um, you know, I believe this will significantly improve uh, the value of those tests and the ROI of engineering time invested in them. And that should, in turn, uh, increase your confidence in being able to make code changes um, and uh, have confidence in them uh, before code merges to production. And that should enable you and your team to merge, release, and deploy much faster. Um, so let's t take a look at a few of the ways in which uh, you know I believe that we're able to uh, make this possible. 
So as I briefly mentioned before, all of this is built to be generated automatically. So we're building these new capabilities uh, such that you don't have to write any, new, any code whatsoever. Uh, all of this can be automatically generated. Uh, because there's no setup, there's no planning or configuration necessary, um, we also believe that this will further lower the bar for a team's attempting to gain insights into uh, some of those dimensions of application quality, uh, you know, pre-production. Um, because of our unique position as an integrated service collaborating directly with our app's uh, test runner, you know, we're able to leverage all of the data that we're already capturing as part of Test Replay and basically intersplice this together with the test code um, to provide us the context for understanding you know, the intention of, uh, of how your application is working. Um, since we're already integrated deep within the software development lifecycle and already a part uh, uh, of test management, uh, the cloud is, you know, we're already in a position where we're using deep uh, Git and CI integration uh, to, for instance, understand how branches are created so that, you know, uh, all of our analyses uh, match the way that you're doing, you know, your branching strategy with, uh, with, with Git flow. Like we understand what's the default branch and we understand uh, what are feature branches. And so producing these reports and analyzing as such, uh, it, uh, it understands that there is no single source of truth. There are many sources of the truth all uh, simultaneously diverging and converging. Um, and this is really what puts us in a position to be able to track uh, and score these changes uh, uh, to these various dimensions over time uh, in a way that's relevant to you and your team's uh, you know, code merging strategies. And uh, you know, while I expect developers will always be the ones who write the test and modify the application co uh, code, you know, our, uh, our goal is to generate these reports to be consumable by anyone uh, who's active on the product development teams. Uh, not just developers or QA engineers, whether it's uh, uh, engineering man uh, management or leadership, whether it's you know uh, product managers or designers. You know, ultimately, uh, we believe that you know increasing uh, the audience and increasing the visibility uh, into this will lead to uh, um, uh, a greater appreciation and uh, encouragement of uh, of writing tests. <clears throat> so of the uh, of the, of the new types of questions that we're looking to answer uh, from the list a few slides back, really these are the three focus areas that uh, that we're primarily working on uh, right now uh, in Q4. And uh, I'd like to go through and take a deeper look at how we're approaching each one of them. So the first one that we have is, um, is interactivity coverage, right? <clears throat> now, what is interactivity coverage? Uh, you probably never heard of it because this is something that I think uh, is pretty unique or novel, uh, and it's never really been done exactly like this. Although I would say, you know, there are some analogs to code coverage. Um, so what is it, interactivity coverage, right? Well, it is simply a page coverage report uh, that calculates, uh, it looks at all the different interactive elements uh, that are potentially on your page, and it looks through the test code to basically ensure that those elements themselves uh, were tested by your test code. So in that way, it's kind of like code coverage in the sense that, you know, code coverage looks at your files, you know, the, the, the files on, on your machine, and then you run the tests, and then it looks at stack traces or, or other sorts of, uh, of, of tracing, and it ensures that uh, effectively code went through that code path. That, that's a little bit like uh, interactivity coverage, except, um, you know, instead of producing a report that's generally only consumable by developers, you know, we're trying to produce this report um, that is representative of your actual application so that anyone can understand this. In fact, like we uh, produce a visual overlay uh, highlighting what has or hasn't been tested. And since, you know, everyone here is both developing and testing your application, you know, you you have all the context necessary to understand, you know, the value and importance of each of those interactive elements uh, across your uh, applications pages. And um, why is this valuable? Well, producing an interactivity uh, coverage report is going to help you understand, you know, what what coverage you have, as well as areas that you may have missed. Um, it's also going to, you know, symmetrically help you understand where you may have had uh, duplicative coverage. You know, one of the things that's always kind of 
frustrate me in testing is that it's very much an art and a science. And I've always believed that the more that we can do to sort of crush out the art of it and make it more like a science where there are more objective and quantifiable metrics around how you're doing your testing and the value of it, then, you know, the better position that we'll be in. And if you kind of think about it, code coverage is one of the few sort of objective and measurable reports that we currently have. And so, you know, interactive interactivity coverage is like a, uh, is like a sibling or an answer uh, to that. Just it's more like a three dimensional code coverage report because it's of your application. And, you know, ultimately I hope that that is going to um, help drive and inform more data-driven decisions around uh, improving test coverage. And uh, <clears throat> it, uh, if you look at it through the lens of deduplication, it can also help you prune or find tests that uh, aren't necessarily adding any new value. You know, if a test is only testing uh, elements that have effectively been covered by other tests, you know, you have uh, a test itself that's, uh, that's not really offering anything unique. So uh, I'm going to walk through a quick example of what this looks like. So let's take some Cypress code in this before each, which is going out and we're visiting this page. So, you know, uh, fake page, but uh, let's assume, you know, we're testing uh, Cypress's login. And if we wanted to uh, count the number of interactive elements, well, each of these things that effectively can be interacted with is an interactive element. So that is the denominator. There's, there's five there. And then if we come back and look at our individual tests, uh, we can see that, you know, we've got three tests and each one is interacting with a uh, different unique element on this page. So effectively, uh, this page, or rather this, this snapshot of the page, uh, had three elements tested and two elements that went untested, which means that its, uh, its test coverage or element coverage uh, 60% and that means that you missed two of five. And the way that we're building the system is basically like we have a reverse dependency uh, graph. We understand the relationship of what tests went through what element and what elements uh, were, you know, uh, map back to, you know, many different tests. And that gives us or affords a lot of flexibility and capability to, you know, derive these things and basically use these as like almost a series of, of waypoints to where we understand, you know, the navigation, the flow throughout your, your application. And <clears throat> um, what I'm going to show now is some of the, I would say, high fidelity uh, uh, mocks that we have uh, as we've uh, uh, looking to uh, release this in uh, late Q4. So, you know, if you've utilized our Cypress Cloud, uh, you've probably seen, you know, the conventional, you know, number of tests, uh, uh, failures, passes, uh, skipped, or the amount of flaky tests. Well, you know, we're intending to surface these dimensions uh, directly um, in the familiar areas in which you see the results. So in this case, this is uh, a runs list. This is basically saying that across all your pages, you had 57% element coverage. And if we look at run overview, which is the details of an individual run, we can see that we've introduced a new tab here uh, called interactivity. And in this case, this run had 57% uh, coverage. And if we click into that tab and, and uh, take a look at it, um, <clears throat> we can see the individual pages as well as uh, all of the snapshots that were found per page. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about what snapshots are, but effectively, we have a way of grouping uh, interrelated uh, snapshots or snapshot states because every new state is effectively a snapshot. Each each thing could incrementally introduce uh, interactive elements, and so you know there are quite a few, and we roll those up into uh, into pages. And what we're doing here is we're effectively looking across all the snapshots of a page and figuring out all the unique. Uh, elements that were meant to be tested and we're giving you, you know, a coverage score all the way down to each individual page. So if we were to, you know, inspect this sign in page, um, then you'll see some elements uh, of, of uh, test replay here, but effectively we're producing, you know, these new reports that are interactive that give you the individual feedback uh, to help you understand what was covered by what. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, in this case, uh, 
we're uh, focused on this uh, snapshot of the sign-in page. Sign-in page has uh, 40 percent uh, uh, coverage today because uh, two elements were were tested, three were not. Uh, we're giving you the visual representation of it, so you can see like that's the uh, remember me uh, input, and we're highlighting it to indicate you know that it was missed. And on these others here, we're saying they're covered, and they were covered by three. Uh, three different interactions across the various tests. Uh, if we were to click uh, into that, uh, then we're going to, you know, focus on that one individual element. And, you know, it, it's important to note here that, you know, an element can be found across many different snapshot states. So effectively, you know, this is just showing you the first one, um, but there could be many different contexts. In fact, if we look right here, we can basically see a, a secondary state when the username and password is invalid. And you know that that snapshot still contained that element, so it is effectively you know uh, missing uh, across all those states. That does not mean you have to interact with it across every snapshot permutation. In fact, you just have to interact with it with one. But we're basically representing or showing you all the different you know sources or locations in which like this was detected and where you could write a test. Uh, you'll also notice a test replay button up here. Uh, this is a drop down, and as I mentioned before, we have like a dependency graph between the tests and uh, <clears throat> and um, the individual elements. And so, what this is going to do is this is basically going to show you pop open test replay uh, and take you directly to you know the uh, the time slice uh, of when uh, when that uh, that um, uh, element was found. So you can effectively you know go back and see what caused it to render or how it appeared. Um, it maps directly to the tests, and so that becomes your lead into, you know, knowing uh, uh, where to write the code um, if a, you know, a test is basically, you know, close to it or at least passed by it. Uh, that would be the location to write the the test. <clears throat> so if we go back to our test code, simulating this, and uh, we go in and now add this uh, this action here to interact with the element. Uh, now, when we record a run and, of course, we interact with it, uh, when we come back here on our next run, we'll see that the coverage for this page increased you know, from 40% to 60%, as you'd expect. Uh, and now we come back into our report and, you know, it is, uh, it is now covered. Uh, <clears throat> so pretty straightforward, pretty much exactly how you expect, uh, you know, if this was a code coverage report to work. Uh, so quick summary, um, effectively, you know, interactivity coverage is like a UX based lens uh, to show you what what has been tested, what has not been tested. Uh, we hope that uh, and uh, expect teams to use this and to for the reports to be far more understandable, uh, uh, widen the, uh, the personas that can get value out of them. Obviously, we're going to highlight missing and redundant coverage. Hopefully that contributes to, you know, informed data driven decisions about the quality of your testing and results in uh, improving your applications quality and giving you higher confidence. Next thing we're going to talk about is uh, accessibility reporting and uh, what is accessibility reporting? Well, accessibility report is is uh, is exactly that and it surfaces um, accessibility violations uh, on a per page snapshot really. Uh, very similar to interactivity, it's just measuring a completely different thing. And as you'd expect, uh, this is also a very interactive uh, debugging experience to help you visual, visualize and understand uh, the accessibility problems uh, across your application. Uh, why is it valuable? You know, accessibility, uh, accessibility is a core part of quality for many organizations. Uh, I know that it is not for all organizations, but for many uh, it is, and this is intended uh, to uh, to help those orgs get these insights uh, into accessibility. And also what I mentioned earlier, uh, we believe that doing this in an automated way as, as a side effect of your test running will also lower the bar uh, and the hurdle for uh, organizations to get access to this so that the ones um, who are, you know, just uh, uh, almost ready to, to make the leap or start factoring this in, it's no longer, you know, a mile high hurdle uh, to, uh, to start tracking these things and uh, start focusing on this. Um, <clears throat> just like with interactivity coverage, you know, this is all about providing objective uh, metrics uh, that help you understand 
uh, how accessible your website or application is in the way that automated tools, uh, which is a portion of being a fully compliant and accessible uh, organization, but insofar as automation tools can provide uh, reliable uh, scores uh, to measure your accessibility, uh, this is going to do exactly that. And um, as I mentioned before, this doesn't require any sort of specialized knowledge. There's no configuration. There's no setup to, to generate any of these. They're automatically generated as a result of the test. Uh, so just like with um, interactivity coverage, we've now got a new uh, <clears throat> report score that's on every run. And of course, uh, it gets its own tab in the, um, uh, the run overview. Looks very similar to interactivity. Uh, you can see we try to design these similarly, uh, design the experience at the same time. And uh, so if we come back into our uh, sign-in page, uh, uses a lot of the same concepts that we just saw for interactivity. Uh, but now we're going to get some new information, uh, and we are going to learn about the accessibility of our application, or in this case, the, uh, the sign-in page. So we can see that uh, in this case, this uh, sign-in page does, in fact, have uh, two violations. One's critical, uh, and one is a serious uh, violation. And if we you know, pop open uh, the, the critical violation, we can see that the first violation is warning us uh, that um, that this uh, that this link element uh, doesn't have a name, so it says links must have uh, discernible text, and uh, that is uh, that is the uh, the selector uh, for that. So there's like a little anchor tag there, and it's actually wrapping a uh, an image of uh, of our logo here, and um, <clears throat> uh, there isn't any text presence. Uh, 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 within the image, and so uh, that could not be uh, read aloud by a screen reader. Uh, of course, you know this is using the same uh, technology as test replay, so you can basically just right click on that image, inspect it in your dev tools, and understand uh, exactly what the HTML looks like. And if we uh, pop over to the other uh, violation here, uh, this one is about uh, color contrast, right? So if uh, contrast is not good enough, uh, then some people with uh, disabilities will not be able to read that text content. And you can see, you know, our UI is basically surfacing the metadata. It's uh, indicating what are the individual colors. If we actually uh, go back real quick, you'll see like this is basically inspecting, you know, this this disabled state of the sign in button, which uh, does in fact not have enough uh, contrast. So by selecting this, you know, it's going to highlight the element uh, that is uh, violating the contrast rule. And um, yeah, and you can see it's from the, the gray on gray text for this button. Um, so, you know, we can go in and inspect this button to see where the colors are coming from and understand what we need to change. And, you know, below that, there's one other contrast error with uh, different colors. So let's select that. And this takes us to a different snapshot that's still on the sign in page, but it's a different state of it. It's after we've submitted the username password. And uh, you know now we have a, a different uh, contrast uh, violation. And again, you know Cypress highlighting the matching element to help you debug. Now all these scores, as well as uh, the list of violations, is as I mentioned being generated under the hood. And uh, I wanted to you know call out and make a shout out that uh, that uh, AxCore, uh, uh, the library created by uh, the company DQ. Uh, AxCore is the gold standard for accessibility testing. Uh, it's definitely the most popular, uh, widely used uh, library uh, that developers and testers are using. It's even built into uh, dev tools. And I also wanted to uh, extend a warm welcome to uh, Dylan uh, Barrel. He is uh, the creator of AxCore, and he's actually here today. He's giving a talk, uh, I think, two talks, two talks down. Uh, and he will be giving uh, way more information about, you know, how an organization should be thinking about accessibility. Automation is just one, one slice of the pie. Uh, there's a whole lot more uh, to it and uh, excited to, uh, to hear that talk and, and learn about those things. <clears throat> uh, obviously, uh, you know, we are uh, uh, big fans of, uh, of AxCore. This is what is powering uh, these violations under the, under the hood. And of course, we'd love to hear, you know, more from the community about uh, ways in which uh, 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 Y'all think that you know we could collaborate and work together. Uh, last little thing I want to mention is that you know uh, 
DQ, I would say, is effectively the industry authority around uh, accessibility, whereas accessibility for us is really just one dimension across many that, that we are interested in surfacing. Uh, and uh, as such, like uh, whenever we're displaying these violations, we take you straight to their website uh, in which they have a robust amount of documentation uh, to help you understand and explain what these uh, individual violations and errors mean. <clears throat> All right, so um, uh, summary, uh, same, same type of stuff that we just basically said, no extra test code needed. Uh, you're going to get these reports across all the pages and all the runs. So you can be able to track the changes over time. You can set goals, track progress, uh, recommend prioritizing it, fixing the issues based on what matters most to you as a business, address the most important user journeys first. Uh, and with that, we have uh, visual testing. Um, <clears throat> might be going over by just, by just a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> I think I've got four minutes, so we'll, we'll blitz this pretty quickly, right? So visual diffing. Um, visual diffing is also not new, just like uh, accessibility testing. It's not something that uh, that we're inventing. We're just hoping to make it much, much, much uh, better, more reliable, easier, uh, simpler to use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, visual testing, I think of, of all the different dimensions, it actually complements functional the best, like peanut butter jelly. Something could be completely functionally working, but look, you know, totally screwed up and it behaves functionally just fine. It's an incredibly important part of testing and it's got this unique aspect to it where uh, whereas a functional test, the test should effectively always pass because it's describing behavior. With a visual uh, test, it's actually different. Like in fact, change is expected. In fact, I would even say that that is the norm. And so visual testing, the actual, you know, diffing of, of pixels or different forms of, of, of AI, I would actually say is not the hard part. That is uh, fairly routine. What's much, much more difficult is for those to be deterministic, to be stable, to be reliable, and most importantly, to create workflows around like uh, whether that change is expected or not. And so this is, uh, this is an area that we're also uh, looking to get into. Uh, quick example here, like if we just look at uh, a couple commits like this is from our own cloud if we have commit one and commit two and we merge them together you'll see that the header change that's a visual change visual diff would look something like this it would indicate you know what is uh what has changed and as i mentioned just because something changes doesn't mean that there's any kind of functional problem or that it's actually uh broken or not uh all it's basically doing is it's surfacing that there was a visual change and uh this is why like we you know need to create uh individualized workflows that you know give your team the ability to approve or deny those 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 visual changes um and so that is that is a big component as part of this and now you know while visual diffing is incredibly helpful uh it's not without i would say significant challenges and limitations and drawbacks um <clears throat> The first is that uh, it always requires uh, code. Um, effectively, this has to be integrated directly into the testing framework on a line by line, test by test basis. There's a pretty significant learning curve around how to plan and how to do that effectively, what states to take. Uh, this is an example from our own code base, one individual project. You know, when you have a ton of different developers and you have hundreds and then thousands and possibly tens of thousands of snapshots, uh, that is a whole lot to manage. It really requires the developers to coordinate, to know what's been covered and not co covered. Uh, and it can oftentimes become, you know, uh, a mess pretty quickly. Uh, in addition to that, because many of these tools are written not as a native integration, but rather they are given limited information by the testing framework. Uh, you can kind of think of a lot of visual tests are kind of like how assertions used to work back in the day uh, before there was Cypress. They wouldn't retry. Uh, effectively, you know, a visual testing tool receives, you know, a either an image or it receives uh, the DOM as a snapshot and it renders exactly that one frame. But, you know, the browser is, uh, highly, highly unstable, it's, it's mutating constantly, it's changing, and uh, that means that unless that frame was given or handed off perfectly every single time, you're gonna have a lot of noise in the visual uh, snapshot. 
And so that leads to a lot of instability and flakiness. And it's it's really just like testing. If your tests are inconsistent, then you effectively you know stop trusting the tool, and it really undermines uh, the value or the potential value of the investment that you're making. And you know this happens in a myriad of different ways. Like this is just a simple example. One commit to the next, and you can see that you know all that's changing is this little animation. Uh, this is basically just you know the browser rendered. Uh, in one commit and then uh, rendered a little bit faster, a little bit slower in the next. Uh, there wasn't any code change related to this, you know, but it's still seen as a visual change. So you kind of get this flapping back and forth of like a lot of different snapshots, like changing and then changing back and then changing and then changing back. And it's a lot of work to basically uh, write your test code in such a way in which like, um, you know, all the state changes are, are effectively guarded. So it's 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 a it's really finicky and it's a lot of work to manage. And the and the last thing is is you know like I said, visual testing and uh, functional testing go hand in hand. It's like peanut butter jelly, right? Like they're all going to come from the individual tests themselves, uh, right? You know from within the same uh, code. But you know, uh, oftentimes these services are split out across multiple tools, and that means like the data. And that knowledge is basically split or partitioned across multiple systems. Uh, and there's not really a good integration or there's a, there's generally a lack of history and context across them. Uh, <clears throat> this is Percy system. Like we're actually a long time user of, of Percy and they do a lot of things that are very similar to us or like any CI provider that capture the builds or trying to show you all the information there. Uh, they do some things like automatically name the snapshots after the test to give you that context. But ultimately, it would be much, much better if all of your diffs were co-located uh, with your tests. You had that nice dependency graph so you could understand like what tests are taking what, what, uh, what snapshots and effectively just put all that data in the same place. Um, and, uh, uh, just like with the other dimensions, because of the, the architecture that we built with test replay, you know, we're not susceptible, I think, to the primary reason that, uh, that, uh, visual tests are unstable. Whereas, um, other services are given like an individual frame because we effectively have all the frames, like every single thing that the browser did, every single DOM change or mutation, even understanding like when it did in fact render. Uh, puts us in an incredibly powerful position to uh, not have to or not be susceptible to a lot of like the foundational problems that you've seen uh, with other services. In other words, we effectively have like a retrying assertion uh, and it can match across multiple frames or it can understand what the state of the DOM was or what led to that, uh, uh, to that desired snapshot in order to increase the reliability of this. <clears throat> uh, Quick example and almost done, a couple more slides. Imagine if I had this test code, which is like testing a hero's app. Effectively, like what we would do behind the scenes is we would automatically produce these screenshots, uh, just like with the other services, there's no code for you to write. Um, and so if we go through the same scenarios as an admin, it would have produced all of those. And that also basically like pushes the management of the screenshots, like rather than for you to have to like plan and prepare for all of these things up front, you know, our system will just detect them and then you can subsequently, you know, decide to manage them, whether it's replacing dynamic or uh, replacing dynamic content with static content, like instead of having to code for that or not knowing what kind of feedback you're going to get when you make the test code it, with this you're doing sort of all the post reconciliation or post management once these uh, artifacts already exist. So it's, it's very WYSIWYG, you know, what you see is, is what you get. Um, so last little bit here. So kind of putting it all together, the, the taking these three dimensions, you know, uh, imagine, you know, you have the first run in which like we detect this snapshot is new on the login page. Um, we can tell you that the page is new. Uh, we go ahead and score it, given an accessibility score and interactivity uh, coverage. And of course, there weren't any visual changes. There was nothing before that, which means that zero of two elements were, were tested. Let's just say all you did was visit, you didn't do anything else. And then in the next run, uh, you update your test code uh, and uh, you test those two elements. And so now it jumps up to 100%. 
Uh, but let's say we also made some application changes, and so our accessibility uh, score uh, went up on this individual page, and we also knew that there were no visual changes. Now, in the third run, we didn't change uh, our code or our test code. We didn't change you know, anything that would influence the accessibility score, although this probably would have, but we just changed the, the color of the sign-in button. This is an example where we would detect that we would understand you know, when the snapshot was introduced, how it's evolved over time, surface that to you, provide a workflow around that. Um, <clears throat> probably uh, didn't uh, say one of the most important things that uh, visual, visual diffing is of the three services, the longest and hardest. We are, although we're working on that in Q4, we don't plan to have that come out in Q4, although that's slated for Q1, but we are uh, on track to have accessibility and interactivity coverage uh, released in uh, Q4 uh, this quarter, this year. Thank you. Awesome.